morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from across the world. I'm Karen Cho, anchor for CNBC. Thank you so much for joining this conversation for the Sustainable Development Impact Summit. Now, we're going to pick up on one of the topics that is regularly in the headlines, cryptocurrencies, but we have a very specialised approach to it today. We're going to just really dig into the detail with this title, Towards Sustainable Cryptocurrencies. And we have effectively seen huge change in the market capitalization, the dominance of these cryptocurrencies over the past year, uh, growing from $250 billion to $1.5 trillion. But with the explosive growth, there's been increased attention on cryptocurrencies, energy use, and just how we can build a more sustainable ecosystem for cryptocurrencies. So we will be delving into this with our panelists uh, shortly for the next 40 minutes or so. But we do want to get you, the audience, involved straight from the outset as well. So for our top link audience, uh, we will be using Slido to understand your knowledge on today's topic. We're going to incorporate your questions into this discussion towards the end of this as well. So please do get involved. If you are coming to us today on live stream, we'll also be able to view the results of the poll on your screens along with us. So let's dive in and let's get started. And I'm going to pitch this to our audience today, to our top link audience. You've received a link in the poll on the Zoom chat. So the question today, can crypto help drive environmental sustainability or will it ultimately lead to climate calamity? So please fill in your responses now, get involved on that poll and we'll take a look at the responses shortly. In the meantime, I'm gonna introduce you to our audience uh, and to our panelists today. David Birch joins us. Premier of Bermuda, Bermuda government. Thank you very much for joining us today, Premier. Lucia Gallardo joins us, founder and chief executive officer of Emerge. Lucia has been a serial entrepreneur building socially impactful emerging technology solutions. Tamika Tilleman is global head of policy and partner at Andreessen Horowitz, uh, which is a big venture capital giant, also has been one time aide to the then Senator Joe Biden. So huge background on policy. Melton Demirs joins us as well, Chief Strategy Officer at CoinShares and joined the cryptocurrency industry back in 2015. So in some ways a veteran of this industry these days as well. Now later on, we are going to have some closing re remarks from Sheila Warren, who is a Deputy Head for the Center for the Fourth Industrial Revolution, member of the Executive Committee at the World Economic Forum. So we're looking forward to Sheila's comments a little bit later on. So let's just revisit that poll, as uh, hopefully many of you have been involved in that poll. Let's see what those results look like, so we can just get a little bit of a test as to where the audience sits today, which is an overwhelming response. Look at that. Uh, the question again, can crypto help drive environmental sustainability, or will it ultimately lead to climate calamity? And you can, you can see 71% responding saying there's potential, and I'm interested to learn more about this today, just 29% on the climate calamity page, but I'm open to learn of its potential. So that is fascinating about where the audience sits at this point. Well, first up, let's tackle this issue of sustainability. How do we ensure that crypto is more sustainable? Premier, let me come to you first. Bermuda has been described as a, a crypto-friendly jurisdiction. Now, recently, you issued a special license to an over-the-counter trading platform to roll out cryptocurrency trading. Is it right to roll out the red carpet to cryptocurrency players when there are huge environmental concerns about the energy consumption of cryptocurrencies? Uh, thank you, uh, Karen, for the question. Uh, from an economic development perspective for a country like ours, it absolutely is because innovation when you're an island in the middle um, of the Atlantic, 700 miles away uh, from the nearest landmass, you have to be innovative in order to attract business and to make sure that you can continue um, uh, to uh, provide uh, for the people inside of your country. But I think the broader question is, does it make sense uh, recognize the climate implications? And I think that what we see inside of crypto is that it is changing and we can certainly see that the market will play out. And I think what we need to do is to make sure that people can understand what are the uh, implications of the cryptocurrencies of which they may be using? Um, how do we make sure that people can have choice? And how do we make sure that the cryptocurrencies that do not uh, lead to severe uh, energy consumption are the ones that can be preferred and used? So I think from that perspective, um, as the question uh, that was posed, uh, there are certainly a lot of options and it's not one size fits all when it comes to crypto. 
I mean, I just want to follow up with you. I am at a fintech event and I've been there a week, so I understand the need for financial innovation and embracing it. But as you issue these digital asset business licenses uh, from the Bermuda Monetary Authority, to what extent should there be some sort of provision that weighs up sustainability, given that we're trying to hit Paris targets? Well, I think that's a great question. And the type of business of which we do, um, the companies themselves aren't the ones actually issuing and creating cryptocurrencies. We're talking about people who are exchanges, persons who are custodians, uh, persons who are holding it. But I think the broader question is what role does government have to play insofar as encouraging the future? We believe that crypto um, is going to be a massive role of the future and is going to the future of the way in which we transfer value. And so I think from a government perspective, we certainly should be recognizing that uh, with certain protocols, there can be extreme energy use and speaking about how we can go ahead and modernize or what's necessary to make sure that it can be sustainable in the future. Premier, thank you. Lucia, let me come to you. You've been conducting successful work in the socially impactful emerging technologies. Is there a way in your view that crypto is more sustainable in future so it has a positive impact on society? Yeah, thanks for the question. I think um, this question and this topic is interesting to me because it does presume that you know crypto is somehow not sustainable. And if we are looking at the definition of, I guess, sustainability that the world kind of recognizes is this notion of meeting our own needs without compromising the ability of like future generations to be able to meet their own. And if that's the case, then we really need to make this distinction that sustainability is not just environmentalism. And we don't just need to worry about natural resources. We also need to worry about economic resources and about social resources. And so embedded into this notion of sustainability, we need to find more concern for social equity and for economic development. And if that's the case, then I think, you know, what is more sustainable than technology with a foundational premise to concern itself with both social and economic development? And so in this way, I think, uh, crypto is certainly more sustainable than the traditional banking sector. Uh, it's democratizing financial tools so that people can build economic resilience and sustainability. Um, and, you know, if it's about making crypto even more sustainable, then I think continuing down this path of investing in open source development, in leveraging the power of inclusive communities, um, and in making sure that this innovation can continue to be exponential, then, you know, I think we can really say that the crypto community and the crypto space and the crypto sector, the decentralized sector, really embodies the meaning of, of sustainability to me. And so a lot of our work reflects that, that very foundational premise. Lucy, I'm already off script because I want to follow up with you too, because <laughs> in the past, in terms of what you've been up to, you've been concerned about emerging markets and developing economies being left behind with technologies. But in this particular case, El Salvador has been one of the first countries to accept Bitcoin as legal tender, which is well in advance of the approach taken in Western countries. Is that wise to have this full throttle approach when there are concerns about system, systemic risk in society undermining the financial system as well as the environmental sustainability issues? I think this goes back to highlighting, you know, these other aspects of an interconnectedness between the different types of resources within sustainability. You know, a country like El Salvador has not necessarily benefited from the economic system and structure that we have historically had. And other countries in an emerging markets are going to have the same problem. And so when you look at the possibilities and the potential between using this technology and continuing with the status quo of traditional sectors, then I think you know it's really almost like a non-decision for leadership in these countries to try to leverage the new technology to suit and to build their own economic resilience and strength. Now, the rollout itself, I think there there's a lot to be debated in terms of how they've gone about doing that. But I think at the very foundational you know, premise of being a governor for El Salvador and trying to build El Salvador's economic resilience and strength and wealth and you know, well-being for its citizens, I think looking toward innovation as a way to do that is, is a really intelligent move on their behalf. And you know, we are not going to be surprised when more countries sort of look at this technology and this space and say, there is potential here to do things differently. And I know for certain that traditional mechanisms have not worked thus far. 
to Micah, plenty of people want to hear from you too, given your background in policy. And I want to get to what we're seeing on in the United States, a huge push by the current administration to really turn the focus towards sustainability. That's an investment, reducing industry's carbon footprint and a government that is very much trying to give the green light to that. So to Micah, as we talk about how crucial it is for the industry to try and tackle energy consumption, what can you say on that front? Well, what we're seeing is that Web3, which is the broad family of technologies that include blockchain and consensus-based computing uh, systems, really don't need to be, and in most cases are not particularly energy intensive. Uh, Ethereum, which is the most commonly used protocol in, in Web3 applications, is moving to a proof of stake form of establishing consensus. That system will be 1,000 times less energy intensive uh, than proof of work models. The Flow blockchain, which powers uh, a number of games and applications like NBA Top Shots, uses a really negligible uh, amount of energy. And we see some blockchains, like the Celo blockchain, which is based on proof of stake, which is actually carbon negative and processes tens of thousands of transactions a day. So this is a very important conversation. I, I don't want to give the impression uh, that it's not. Uh, but even in the, the realm of uh, traditional proof of work blockchains, like the Bitcoin blockchain, we are seeing uh, many of the uh, operators of data centers that secure that network moving toward renewable power. 76% of them use renewable power as part of their mix. Uh, many of those watching uh, this broadcast will know that every 10 minutes or so, you have uh, a number of Bitcoin that are released to the operators of those data centers as the incentive for securing that network. And we see the, uh, the process of mining really less as a bug and more as a bounty on finding clean, renewable energy. Uh, and that's what it should be if, if policymakers do their job going forward. So, Micah, if I could just bring up some other stats, though, because I feel like you cherry-picked the, the best from the industry. I mean, the stats around Bitcoin are abysmal at this point. The energy usage of TVs in the United States is equivalent to, to Bitcoin's uh, energy footprint. If you look at uh, the, the gap towards uh, what you're seeing in the copper industry, almost equivalent to the copper industry in terms of the energy consumption, it's closing the gap on that. Uh, Elon Musk recently couldn't make Bitcoin work because of the ESG principles. Uh, effectively, just crossed the line for a lot of investors. It, wasn't uh, renewable enough in his view. What do you say on that front? Well, there's definitely a lot of work to be done as it relates to the Bitcoin blockchain. The Bitcoin blockchain is a relatively small piece of the much broader story that is occurring in the Web3 landscape. Uh, so I think we, we need to continue working with the Bitcoin community to bring more renewables into the power mix uh, for the, the Bitcoin blockchain. But we should also really keep our eye on the prize, which is fostering a new generation of uh, computing that's going to be ideally much more more resilient, much more secure, much more democratized, and frankly, much more sustainable than many of the legacy systems it replaces. Micah, thank you. Let me get to Melton, because Melton, you're an investor, an advisor, an advocate for crypto. In your view, what does a cryptocurrency need to do at this point to cross the sustainability hurdle? Yes, great to be here. Um, so at CoinShares, we manage $6 billion in assets, and we were the first to research Bitcoin's energy usage. In fact, the 76% number that Tamika quoted comes from our research, which we conducted in 2019. Bitcoin is already one of the most sustainable industries in the world. The U.S. power mix today is only 20% renewables. The Bitcoin industry's power mix today is 50% renewables in the United States of America, as published in in Q2 by the North American Bitcoin Mining Council and was over 70% globally. Uh, Cambridge Center for Alternative Re uh, Financial Research has also studied the Bitcoin energy uh, usage question. And again, one of the things that's really unique about Bitcoin is that it's fully transparent in its energy usage, unlike any other industry in the world. Really, the conversation we're having is a subjective conversation about uses of energy. But the bigger question is sources of energy. Today, 
the U.S. government subsidizes the fossil fuel industry, which is a multi-trillion dollar, very mature industry, to the tune of $20 billion per year. The European Union subsidizes the oil and gas industry to the tune of $30 billion per year. The Bitcoin industry has never received a single dollar of government subsidies or government funding and has single-handedly put more renewable energy on the grid and made it economically viable to invest in, develop, and build out renewable energy power generation. And to me, that is really the profound opportunity here. The private sector, in this instance, the Bitcoin sector, can do a lot to solve problems that the public sector has been unable and unwilling to solve without impacting taxpayers and burdening them with even more debt. Future generations, i.e. my generation, is facing an unprecedented amount of fiscal uh, liability in the form of all of these subsidies and all of these bailouts that are happening in multiple industries that are mature, well-developed industries, and crypto has none of that baggage. Um, furthermore, I think the point Lucia raised, you know, ESG is not just about the E. You're focusing very much on the E. The S and the G are far more important. Financial violence is the number one form of violence in our world today in the form of sanctions and economic access not being available, crypto is equalizing that playing field. Bitcoin is by far the most widely utilized financial system, and it is not. it does not discriminate. It is unable to discriminate. New types of blockchains that are being launched, as Tamika alluded to, are enabling a wide variety of economic use cases that enable 24-7, 365 access to anyone with a computer and an internet connection. So again, I think it's very important when we have this conversation to focus on not just the E, but also the S and the G, but also to remember that this isn't a subjective story about who should or should not be allowed to use energy. We don't have energy police. And the fact is that the, the sources of energy, right, are a big part of the issue. And I'd love to see the conversation shift to how public uh, policy is influencing the mix of sources of energy. We're not using nuclear. We're shutting down nuclear power plants and putting more coal-fired plants on the grid. That's directly antithetical to the sustainability narrative that's being pushed. So we need to hold our leaders accountable for answering these questions about talking about sustainability, but actually doing the opposite by shutting down some of the most sustainable sources of energy that we have on the grid today. It simply does not add up. Uh, Melton, just quickly, can I pick up on this point, uh, thought-provoking point about subsidizing the cryptocurrency industry so it can have renewable solutions? One of the stumbling blocks That's is that- That's not what I said. I did not say we need to subsidize it. I said it can create more renewable sources of energy without requiring a single dollar of government funding. I'm not asking you think for it should, So you don't think it should have access to, to subsidies? No, I don't. I actually think the cryptocurrency sector is using private market incentives of supply and demand in order to bootstrap these economic effects that make it financially sustainable to fund renewables instead of relying on trillions of dollars of infrastructure bills and more debt. We can create private market incentives to fund renewable energy build. And again, I think for folks like myself who are facing down a tremendous mountain of debt, my generation has not built the wealth that prior generations have and are severely behind when it comes to wealth distribution. I think we're very concerned about the levels of spending we're seeing that are fundamentally unsustainable. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let me come to Lucia again. I, well, I want to get to this next uh, topic on metrics. How do we ensure that the crypto sector has an effective strategy for mitigating environmental impact? Uh, how do you think about these metrics? Is there a way to bring that into the mix when we talk about a sector that's quite unregulated? I think uh, this is interesting, and it also taps into a lot of what Melton is saying. You know, the world has struggled with this question generally, not just within the crypto sector. Um, we've been, you know, trying to figure out how to really measure the efficacy of impact across time. And we've seen, uh, you know, a boost of investment once the ESG framework came into play and it allowed for incentives to, to play a role in how much attention the private sector and traditional industries were paying to these kinds of, you know, topics. And yet, when we look at the crypto industry, uh, as Melton pointed out, it receives little to no subsidies across board, and it is still um, continuing to be a forceful, you know, you know, way of changing the way that we think about these metrics. And there are specific, you know, 
components that are already in the fundamentals of the crypto sector. You already have a lot of community-led innovation. You already have a lot of traceability and transparency of information. You have the ability for the public, the wide public, to hold you know, the industry accountable. And you already have the global connectedness of the sector, which means that you know, maybe right now we don't have the frameworks for DAOs and protocols specifically to be driving further uh, investments into ESG-like uh, initiatives. But I think that in a few years' time, the sector will actually be quite exemplary in driving the measuring and also um, sort of boosting community uh, attention toward these kinds of issues, specifically because at its core, uh, you know, the Bitcoin sector can actually use its own structure and its own, um, you know, organization to drive all of these factors. Um, I think two truths can be two things can be true at the same time. We can have a traditional sector, you know, that is incredibly behind on the kind of progress energy consumption and otherwise that the Bitcoin sector has been driving for the short amount of years that it's been in existence. And we can also say that the crypto sector still has a long way to go, but only one of those is organized to specifically drive progress in a particular direction that is public benefit. And that is the very fundamental philosophy around financial sovereignty, around decentralization, and around open source community-led initiatives and development and innovation. Thank you very much. Uh, Premier, let me come back to you. As we talk about metrics here, we're, we're trying to embark upon a box ticking exercise in some ways for cryptocurrency. How sustainable are they? Uh, where they sit on, on the various uh, timeline? But if we think about it and we step back and we think about it more broadly, we have the same questions around ESG for a lot of corporations around the world that have been in business for many, many years. And one of the common criticisms from the investment community is that it's just really a self-assessment at this point. There's no genuine way of telling whether a lot of these companies tick ESG. There's no global standard. So how do we then stretch to a cryptocurrency sector that is unregulated and in its infancy and then ask them to uh, embark upon the same box ticking exercise? I think that one of the beauties of the cryptocurrency and uh, crypto in general is the fact that those type of things can be programmed into it. The incentives can be created inside of the actual uh, blockchain itself. And so it allows these incentives to take place. What Melton was speaking of um, is brilliant. And it makes sense that the fact that because it creates these incentives, it has seen an increase in renewable energy that is actually driving increased renewable energy adoption throughout the world. I mean, it, when it comes to uh, crypto, you can say, you can figure out where your crypto is being mined, how is it, and to make sure you can find out to make it traceable. And those things can be programmed into crypto which you can't do on a broad level. You can't tell if a company is telling the truth in your self-assessment, but when it comes to the trust that is inherent inside of blockchain systems, that trust there makes it say it is verifiable that yes, this is coming from a clean source. You can't do that when it comes to companies and self-reporting. Tamika, do you want to jump in on this as we talk about whether there is a natural advantage for, for cryptocurrencies to hit these metrics? Well, I certainly think the, the Premier hit it on the head. Uh, the, the beauty of these systems and the potential of these systems is to design a data architecture in which there's far more accountability uh, around the use of energy and a much higher degree of confidence on the part of both consumers and regulators uh, in how sustainability is being brought to bear uh, in business operations. That's true not only of the crypto industry itself, but really much more broadly. We see the potential for blockchain-based systems and Web3 systems to serve as the backbone for new generations of carbon markets and new generations of infrastructure that will be far better equipped to measure the real environmental impact uh, of human activity than what we have today. Achieving that next generation of data architecture uh, should be one of the highest priorities for policymakers. I'm encouraged by some of the initial steps that we're seeing in that regard. We have both within the community uh, self-regulatory efforts that are mo moving toward greater sustainability and encouraging the use of sustainable energy uh, in operation of blockchain networks. But beyond that, we're also seeing efforts to broaden governance uh, of blockchain networks in ways that will be far more conducive to, to good long-term outcomes. At Andreessen Horowitz, we've started delegating some of the governance authority that we hold uh, by virtue of our investment positions in firms 
to nonprofit organizations and civil society organizations that have a keen interest in looking after the public uh, uh, as part of their agenda. So we see some very innovative models for multi-stakeholder governance that are being brought to bear that should, along with this new data architecture, enable far more effective mechanisms uh, for stakeholder capitalism going forward. I want to push on to some of the volatility and the use case for cryptocurrencies, because as we talk about sustainability, there are massive issues in the room here. Melton, I'll come to you on this, because we have seen a pretty volatile week again for cryptocurrencies. And it's one thing whether we talk about them just being an asset class that is tradable and one that speculators are very heavy in. The other point is, you know, what do you use it for as a, a method of transacting and having spent your week at Money 2020? I've spoken to a lot of fintech innovators and none of them can come up with a way to fold it into a payment system at this point. The argument is that it's too slow to process. If you have workarounds that the fintech industry are suggesting and then it takes away the decentralized ledger nature and all the benefits that a cryptocurrency brings into the mix. So saying it simply is not workable at that this point. And that is big players, it is small fintech innovators. So we're back to the point where it is just something for the speculators on markets. That's not sustainable, is it? Uh, those points you raised are fundamentally untrue. If we look at the actual facts, and again, at CoinShares, we focus on research and, and facts. Again, blockchains are public ledgers. All of the information on a public ledger is visible to anyone and everyone. The Bitcoin network has over 300 million active wallets. These wallets facilitate trillions of dollars of economic activity per year. And I myself am a user of these networks. Now, the unique thing here is cryptocurrencies allow us to transact and interact in an environment where we can't interact through traditional financial intermediaries. I myself have not used bank the banking system to send a wire in over a year. I use crypto. I use stable coins on top of the crypto ecosystem. And in fact, many of my peers, including large funds, are no longer using bank wires to send transactions, which will take three to five days and cost anywhere from $25 to $50. We're using blockchains to transfer value. No, not, with, hey, wait, 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 not with the fintech app. You can send that money instantly bank account to bank account, and that is globally. That does not take that long. That is just picking information. And How are we, we going to allow the other, you know, 4 billion people who live on this planet who don't have a bank account, how are they going to transact? To open a bank account today, you need a government-issued identity. 25% of the world's population does not have a formal government-issued identity. So how do you propose that they interact with the financial system? Should we just leave them out altogether because they don't have an identity or a, a bank account? I mean, again, the Problems we're this trying is something to solve. that wait, wait, wait. This is a, this is something that fintech apps have also been targeting. There is a bunch of them across Africa, for instance, that have the same agenda. That they see mobile apps as a way for a lot of these people that don't have bank accounts to get into the system. So but they're, they're highly exploitative. Yeah, but they're highly exploitative. And let's not forget the amount of discrimination that is applied through the financial system, including mobile money markets in emerging economies. Again, anytime that you have a centralized financial application, what you have is the ability to censor, right? And again, there's a great study that's been done with by the Human Rights Foundation about Bitcoin as freedom money. It's being used by political activists and dissidents in economies and totalitarian governments, which by the way, totalitarian governments are often on the rise around the world, financial freedom, financial privacy is a critical tool to enable dissent in democratic societies. And so it's very important that there are options where users cannot be censored, right? If we look at what's happening in China, for example, dissidents in China are being silenced. They're being banned from using social media. They're being banned from traveling. They're being banned from using the financial system. We could very well see a situation here in the United States. The Biden administration has expressed its intent to Censor people who do not agree with their consensus definition of certain things in society. So it's very right. important for a healthy, free, democratic society that people have the ability to transact financially with mm -hmm. freedom. That's what cash this, is this, for. Cash let's, is not let's get to Lucia. You haven't jumped in for a while. Lucia. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with so much of what Maltima is saying, but also, you know, one of the ways in which I don't have financial freedom is I live nomadically and have an entirely remote workforce. Paying them has been a nightmare across borders. And on top of that, well, not anymore, but, uh, you know, it, ha it was a nightmare for a point in time. And there are controls around how much money I can send at any given time. Even in internal payment structures like Zelle, there's only so much money I can send. And that does not 
uh, you know, mean financial freedom to me. But I think taking a step back in, in the narrow mindedness of a conversation of thinking that digital money, cryptocurrencies is going to act and behave and function in the exact same way that traditional money is going to operate. If we look at the functions of money, money is a measure of value. It's a store of value. It's a unit of account. It's a standard for deferred payments. It's a medium of exchange. It's all of these things. Bitcoin at its core and super utility is a store of value. And it's an incredibly effective way to have value transfer happen um, across borders. And so I think if we take those two aspects of Bitcoin and assess it for what it is, I think it's a superior method of money in those characteristics. DeFi, which by the way, a lot of this, these conversations that are like hating on the cryptocurrency industry is looking at it uh, as a blanket utility rather than the fact that DeFi is actually enabling so many of the other inherent uses of money that I mentioned within the crypto space. And if price volatility is driven in large part part by the varying perceptions of the intrinsic value of money or cryptocurrency or any coin for that matter, then what is really required is, you know, avoiding overly simplistic comparisons of the utility of each cryptocurrency and understanding the true fundamentals of its utility. And then saying, hey, you know, this is what Bitcoin really derives its value from because it is a superior form of transferring value. And it is most certainly a better way to store value than other, you know, commodities and markets. Um, so I think like really important important to get back to the gist of it and not say, you know, we are comparing every cryptocurrency as a blanket directly to money and the functions of money. Uh, to Mike, I want to come to you. Uh, if I can bring up the conversations I've had this week, Klarna, Trustly, Molly, Nexi, none of these companies can get cryptocurrencies to work in online payments at this point. One of the issues too, the volatility in pricing, and then just having settlement in something that is so volatile. These are companies that are incentivized around financial innovation, they want to seize every opportunity, and that includes cryptocurrencies, but practically they can't make it work at this point, which again takes us back to speculation of an asset class on markets. What do you say about that? Is there too much speculation, too much volatility you would like it to stop? And what do you say on the transaction side? Well, I could give you a, a much longer list of companies that are finding ways to uh, make these technologies work. So uh, it, it may be that they just aren't uh, working with the right engineering teams. Uh, these are what the biggest are, fintech giants in the world. These are the fastest uh, uh, fintech companies in the world right now. Yeah, what, what we're seeing is that few things. First, this is a very new set of technologies. So that's, that's point number one. It, uh, for practical purposes, did not exist uh, 12 years ago. Uh, second point, the velocity of innovation in this space is probably unlike anything ever witnessed uh, in the digital economy. Uh, and, and the speed at which we are seeing new solutions developed and implemented is really quite inspiring and hopeful uh, if you're someone who believes in the power of innovation to solve human problems. And third, the most exciting innovations, uh, both as it relates to payments uh, and as it relates to other applications beyond payments in the financial sector, uh, are really still on the horizon. Uh, and, and we should all be very clear about that. Uh, we're fortunate to see companies Companies come in every day that are solving absolutely breathtaking problems using these tools, and they're making it work. Uh, and they're building uh, solutions that are going to have a very profound impact uh, on our lives. So certainly, I don't know anyone who would argue that these are mature technologies today. Uh, and and we, it, it's foolish to think that after a relatively short period of time, if you think about the evolution of the internet, uh, if somebody had said in 1996 that we would all be watching watching all of our television over the internet, uh, and that you and I would be having this conversation over the internet. Uh, folks would have said that that, that was, that was an absurd statement in 1996, and yet here we are. Um, so I, I think we should have uh, a high degree of confidence in the direction of travel uh, around um, how these technologies can be used to solve real world problems going forward. Micah, thank you. Premier, let me come back to you. I want to spend a little bit of time tapping into your thoughts too on the conversation we're having around volatility. There's been further price volatility even this week. We've had some market concerns around the story in China around Evergrande, uh, market concerns around central bank activity. And, you know, cryptocurrencies haven't exactly been a safe haven this week. Are you concerned about the volatility we've been seeing in cryptocurrencies? 
I'm not concerned because I like Tamika and uh, like my panelists, um, who we know very well, and we've been uh, studying and understanding the space. It's it's the very beginning. We are at the very beginning, and the amount of innovation which is taking place um, will change, and the markets will work. Yes, there is speculation. Yes, there is people who are buying coins and thinking that they're going to be rich and all the rest, but that is no different than has happened in any type of, um, uh, I guess I would say, speculative bubble that has happened in the past. But that is not solely the story of what we are seeing here. Uh, there's a difference between the utility of Dutch tulips, between the utility of Bitcoin or some of these networks, uh, smart contracts, the types of networks uh, and systems which are being built out right now. So I think that it is um, an unfair uh, uh, comparison which is made uh, in large measures uh, for persons who um, are looking at the traditional financial system and looking at ways to protect and to sustain uh, the amount of rent extraction which comes out of the economy from there. I think one of the great points that we're given uh, by Lucia at the very beginning is that, you know, this is about also economic sustainability. This is about making sure that people are able to live their lives in a free way without having to rely on intermediaries, big banks, and different things who can say, no, you can't do that. Why should the citizens be told that, no, you can't transfer value from one person to another if they believe that value should be transferred? And so what is going to be unlocked, the additional accountability that it's going to build not only to business, but also to governments and people who sit in seats like I sit, will only help to make the world a better place. And so I think when we're talking about sustainability, we have to look at it from a broader level. The energy, climate crisis, absolutely. But I think that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies as the systems that are built will help us to be able to make incentives around making, uh, to make that better. Right now, when we go to a supermarket and choose eggs, you can choose whether you're getting, you know, farm raised eggs or other types of eggs. The same thing can happen where you can go in the future and say, you know, I want to make sure that my cryptocurrency was mined ethically. That's the way it can happen. And that's what we can see in the future with these types of technologies. Premier, I want to get in you, your thoughts too on the use of cryptocurrencies to transact in. I mean, clearly we're, we're all odds a little bit in this conversation about where it's at and just how usable cryptocurrencies are at this point. But do you think it's a necessity that the cryptocurrency industry have that use case that you can transact in it rather than just speculate in the price? Those use cases exist right now, currently. I mean, in the government in Bermuda right now, you can pay your taxes with USDC. I mean, it happens right now. So it's not a question of an issue of the use case. The use cases are happening. If you're going to go at it purely from the perspective of Bitcoin, and yes, the, the Bitcoin system and the network itself may be challenged in some aspects, and there are other levels of solutions which make it quicker, but there's multiple solutions which are being built which enable these transactions to happen in real time. So I don't believe that we're looking for use cases. Problems are being solved every Every day more and more. Just finally, before we close out the conversation, what do you say to regulators in some of the developed economies that are concerned about cryptocurrencies undermining the financial system? I think that that concern is valid because cryptocurrencies were, uh, most likely will change the dynamic of the financial system which has been established. But the fact is that human nature cannot push against innovation of society and governments that have found themselves in attempting to try to push back on innovations which will happen naturally uh, don't, often, don't often find themselves coming to, I would say, a peaceful conclusion. Amir, thank you, Melton. Just to you before we close out too, I want to hear your thoughts. Come back in on this. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I, I think, Premier Burt, you said it wonderfully. Look, at the end of the day, this is really about choice, right? Choice is an incredibly powerful thing. And we're not sitting here demanding everyone in the world use cryptocurrencies. But for the first time, so many people around the world have a choice. People who've never had a choice as to what currency they hold now have the ability, the choice to participate in an alternative economic system that has different rules than the one issued by their government. And I think, again, choice is so incredibly powerful. In America, over 20% of American adults hold Bitcoin today. That's a recent study that was done by Nighting Fidelity and Square. That's a fantastic statistic. And again, it speaks to the fact that when given a choice, right, consumers, businesses, governments now are very keen to engage with this new technology. The arc of progress, again, right, it's bending right now towards centralization 
regulation and control. And we see this with COVID, right? Governments are increasingly pushing for control, for censorship, for the ability to dictate who can do or say what based on whether or not their views support those of the, the government that's in power. And again, throughout human history, the ability to have freedom, to have choice, has been a really big accelerator for human freedom, democracy, and open societies. So again, I believe what we're working on is just so foundational and so important to preserving the values that so many of us in the West have around the right to freedom, the right to self-expression, and the ability to dissent and to have peaceful protests. And Bitcoin in its purest form is a form of monetary peaceful protest. We can choose for the first time to exit the petrodollar system, which has caused so much economic damage, so much social damage, and frankly, more environmental degradation and damage than any other technology. The war machine is the most polluting, most damaging thing on our planet. And so again, I'm just very excited about cryptocurrencies as a tool, and just one tool among many to help continue to preserve human dignity and human freedom. Melton, thank you for sharing that enthusiasm with us, but I um, must also say thank you to the Premier, to Lucia, to Micah. Thank you very much for joining us today and contributing to what has been, uh, I think for me, my best crypto conversation I've had all week. So thank you very much for that. Now, as we wrap up this uh, session, just a reminder to our Top Link audience, uh, if you and those tuned into live stream, if you want to participate on social media, get involved as well and uh, get involved in the Top Link chat as well. I didn't take any questions in the end because we had such a, a full conversation there and we didn't get a lot coming through. So I, I didn't exclude you deliberately, but uh, please contribute to the conversation from here. But before we wrap up, I'd like to introduce Sheila Warren to you again, Deputy Head of the Centre for the Fourth Industrial Revolution and Member of the Executive Committee of the World Economic Forum for some closing remarks. Sheila, over to you. Thank you, Karen, and thank you so much to our fantastic panelists for such an engaging, informative, passionate conversation. As is obvious, there's a tremendous amount of interest, but also a tremendous amount remains to be done within and around the crypto ecosystem. And to that end, it's my great pleasure, it's my honor to announce the forum is launching a global initiative called the Crypto Impact and Sustainability Accelerator, which we call CISA. As Premier Burton noted in his early remarks, crypto is going to play a massive role in the digital economy. And we believe it behooves all of us to focus on ensuring that we're not just replicating the world that currently exists, but actually improving the state of the financial system, making it more inclusive, more equitable, and of course, sustainable. Now, sustainability, as our panelists noted, is more than just the environment. And in fact, ESG metrics, as discussed, acknowledge this in their very name. It's not EEE, -E -E, it's ESG. In recognition of that fact, our work is focusing on everything from decarbonization to exploration of decentralized autonomous organizations known as DAOs to ethnographic user research that focuses on what communities and users actually need in order to engage meaningfully in exchanges of value in ways that are empowering and provide them with agency. We agree the potential of blockchain-based and Web3 systems to be more transparent and accountable, which I'll note are very different things, is unprecedented. But this will require both courage and creativity in the face of mainstream conceptions of the realities of this rapidly emerging ecosystem. Our hope is that the Crypto Impact and Sustainability Accelerator will, through global multi-stakeholder collaboration, chart a path forward together to ensure that we improve the state of the world and that financial services are accessible to all, not just a few. So with that, I want to again thank our panel and you, Karen, for an insightful discussion today and for our audience for joining us. Thank you so much for your time.